Hello, and welcome to Writers and Books Visiting Author Series. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages and backgrounds, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is taking care. We're celebrating different ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our upcoming schedule at wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're there. Feel free to submit questions through the Q&A function. Books are available through our bookstore, Ampersand Books. I'll put the link in the chat. We're so excited to have Rosebud Benoni with us this evening. First, we'll hear her read, and then she'll be in conversation with Dan Danielle Pafunda. Danielle is the author of Spite and eight other books of prose and poetry. She teaches at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Rosebud Benoni is the winner of the 2019 Alice James Award for if This is the Age We End Discovery, and the author of Turnaround Bright Eyes. Her chapbook, 20 Atomic Sonnets, is part of a larger project in honor of the periodic table's 150th birthday. She is recipient of the 2014 NIFA Fellowship in Poetry and the 2013 Catamundo Fellowship. Her work is widely published in journals, and she writes for the Kenyan Review blog. The poet, uh, Kyle Dargan said about her latest collection, this phenomenon of a book launches me with its wonder into space and the multiverse, and then somehow discovers compassion where we might expect only to find absence of heat or light. Rosebud, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I'm gonna start off actually by reading a new poem. Um, this is called Mataro's Wrestling with Uncanny Action at a Distance. Um, and it's about quantum entanglement, which is a somewhat complex idea in physics, but in essence, I'll boil it down to one of its components that you can be very, very far away, whether you're in New York City and I'm in California, or you know, I'm in this galaxy and you're in another, but somehow the act of one force will determine the act of another force. In other words, everything is connected. That might sound like a really wonderful idea, but I reframe this in the terms of dealing with abuse. So Matoro's wrestling with uncanny action at a distance. Abuse lingers a strange fog in the after. It putters and casuals, skims strange and faux rafters, where I am not still nor away get after, hangs gossamer and grays, entangles and staff and baffle, slows motion in all its range of cloak and dagger, lingers too long in its actors, who never not trying to capture won't let me stray from how you loved say, like Churchill, not the first who never stopped, painting his pond, the one he had taken to root after his beloved, his marigold was gone among the cattails, I imagine. It wasn't this story who took captive a love trying to get away. Such formaline and shumming laughter. I too am not still a thing of your after. Like how everything has not but is a measurement problem. Like how a painting or roof cannot be the same when beloved is befouled and betrayed. No, it will not be the same even with most severe and unrelenting eyes, cannot victory over the length of a wave. No marigolds can be remade a mine. She and I couldn't be more different from all of you and all of I only understand that kind of tender rage as one who does she can do all her life to stop the arrow of time, which he didn't which you speak softly flitting away at the beams 
with ice pick and closing distance. And if it all ends with a whimper, if it all goes blank, who cannot dismiss there are things like goldfish that swim faster than light, far from coal held days into wilderness, far from men who never step aside. It's that kind of entanglement the incendiary to refuse what clearly makes and moves through hands through arbitrary and wide. When we reach each other's twisted line, you say yours is the first that speaks of the second will do. You say no matter, you'll always know, you'll always find we're all, oh, how I once loved you. How I was never stilled to fuse. No, I'm not the other end of your every oath and every ruse. It's not the same when I feel even the smallest things that linger, those I have yet to lose. So I actually just wrote that last night in one go. Um, I feel a lot better after reading it. So I'll read some poems from the book now. Um, I think I'll start off with the first poem. Um, this book began as an examination of the frameworks of things that were collapsing around me. Um, in 2012, I started to have trouble with my balance and my health overall. And, um, and it was a very odd time for me um, because eventually I got a diagnosis and it was terrifying and I didn't want to hear it. And, what I have doesn't have a cure. And I felt my faith in my religion, which is Judaism, kind of crumbling. Um, I felt the faith in my family kind of crumbling for reasons that are explored in the book, um, as well as the healthcare system and even science. And so I had taken a great interest in string theory as a student, and that too was crumbling um, at the time. It still kind of is, but I won't go into that for, for the sake of time. Um, and, you know, I was kind of just devastated by the lack of foundations in my life. And I had a lot of fear. So I began to like dig deeper into um, a field I abandoned, which is quantum theory and physics at large. And there's this idea that we're living in a simulation. So as a human being, that's terrifying. But as a poet, it's quite fantastic. So this poem I'm going to read, poet wrestling with the possibility she's living in a simulation, actually began when I was getting my blood drawn early on. I had to go like once a week almost for tests. And I kept seeing the same nurse who sat me the same way in the chair, who said the exact same things every time. And I looked at her and I said, this is really weird. This is like almost all orchestrated. Like, is this real? So she told me to go write a poem about it. So I did. All my timelines lead to this poem. Proof what brought us here is all the same horse. So I have some questions. Which of us are the shallow wood? What if blood is emptiness? I suspect my own veins are rogue simulations splitting with a new kind of heightened self-awareness. Proof the nurse says they are flighty and hard to find. Drink more water, she sings, pushing her own tent. What if what's within is simulated to keep every artery compliant? You know, the whole thing being as being undead, dead creeks. It's also sad to think the envy still filling us over some horse we knew for less than a week is simulated. Don't you feel better at least? Well, do I have news for you. I suspect the horse is also false, bogus, feigned. Proof, he comes running when we do not call for him. Proof, in one timeline, he and I are doing a lot of simulated things. Get your mind out of the gutter. On holidays, we openly bathe in a man-made heated spring. Or rather, he fears the water and balances on edge. Half the time he slips, falls in and blips, holds me responsible. Resets, drink more water, tweaks the anti-horse, threatening to annihilate another anti-horse. Come salt winter, come stone age. So place your bets that advanced civilizations don't always not annihilate themselves. Whoa, 
Let's try this again. Reset. Maybe our most real timeline resides in another verb tense or is hiding in new irregular superlatives. Should we ask for who, whom, whoest? Because why be skinned when you can be scunned? Would you do the honors? My deliberateness says to trust you. One simulation to another, am I wrong? Don't we see we through fire, windmill, heated floors? Were we not a woman waving a white handkerchief? One if by land, skull and bones, ticks in the trees and mysterious reset, nil and please? If nothing else, can we not all agree? Hummingbirds win most fabulous simulations. Even if they are the secret guards and their tears, the antivirus software injecting all those broken one and zeros into our hearts. And surely in one timeline, they are the gods themselves, the superlative whoist of engineers who've made mincemeat of asteroids and atomic time wares. It's too bad that all our timelines are inherently self-destructive. Proof, we watched the same video of a hummingbird snoring for hours, still sitting in the nurse's chair, and not a step closer to what life outside of human reach desires. I'm okay with that. The horse is calling, and I'm running my hands through his mane, unable to explain where and when this comfort this crisis took root. How did we meet? Was it too if I see? I can't remember when we did not cheat life with a horse, when all timelines were a real and even field in which the humming birds drank our blood straight from the creek. So this next poem was based on a conversation I had with my father. And when the poem came out, he said, I don't sound that profound as you're making me out to be, but I still wrote this poem after a conversation we had. Um, it's called Poet Wrestling with Her Empire of Dirt. And again, it sort of deals with the collapsing of the frameworks that were going on in my life. Abba says in a blizzard, fill the bathtub with firewood. Abba says a leaky roof is a blessing, provided the bucket to melt snow. With fire we gather, all the trees and queens shake and shiver. My ax cannot approximate. My ax is a plastic bottle filled with club soda. I wonder when it unfreezes, will it explode? Abba says light of my eyes. Where are you getting your science? I no longer know. I used to believe in string theory, but the field breaks too many rules and you can't quantify nor quantum even a drop of rain. Everything's just too damn big for models that would prove the rules tried and still not true. The roof is always leaking. The bathtub is a mass grave of trees. Abba says, go outside before it's too late. But I have, I've seen. In a public bathroom, I hide with many other women from a storm. The leaky roof fills with cinders and once more, a dead bird, one of us screams. They all scream when I pick him up off the slimy floor, pick the maggot from his body. Soon I have the bathroom to myself in public. I have an entire sanctuary of sorts to mourn. When I bring the dead home, Abba tears at his clothes and covers the mirrors. Won't let me burn the body. Says even birds died in the show of desperate hungry hands. Days before the bodies were turned to ash. Perhaps this bird too descends from a lone survivor. We cry for his mother. We cry for my grandmother. Free up the bathtub and flood our home with rainwater. Float a burning empty pyre. I say, 
Abba, this isn't what we do either. Abba says it's too late to go outside, which I do. I try. I dig and dig for dirt to find my father. I lose the feeling in my hands in snow that doesn't quite stick to the ground. Night falls and his body stays warm under my layers drenched from sleet and sweat. I won't give in. Birds gather around me, dark lights against blue cement. They wait it out. They stay perfectly still, right out in the open. Um, so continuing on sort of the line of my father, um, his mother survived the Shoah, the Jewish Holocaust, and she survived a lot of stuff. Um, and his father, my, my grandfather died when my father was very young. And he actually, when, by the time my father was born, my father pretty much grew up in hospitals because his dad, who was much older than my grandmother, um, was always sick. And my father contracted polio about a year or less before the vaccine was found. And he survived. Um, and I didn't find out about it until later. But my mother told me this story that he played with this little girl as a child who's a very lonely little child and he had this one friend and she died um, from polio and he's never talked about it with me. So when I started to um, show symptoms of my illness, um, my mother who has a strange way of showing affection, um, well, this is what happened. This is poet wrestling with every night she'd crucify herself. Abba doesn't talk about his childhood much or the little girl. It's Mama who tells me about her, that they played together on Shabbat after his father died and Safta had to work two jobs and would take no help from anyone. Mama's never asked if that household kept the Sabbath or what they believed. Mama showing rare restraint until it was discovered she contracted polio and Safta burned his clothes and she burned what little toys they shared in her own pantyhose, even those the little one hadn't torn and grabbed for balance. But still my father was exposed and suffered, his eyes, his spine, a whole host, she died, I'm told. Mama's breath hot on my skin. She's rubbing around the sting in my neck that burns and fades to numbness along arm and shoulder. I'm a little numb these days on my left side. It's not metaphorical. It's not political or related, though I wish perhaps another life. She died. And she holds me, my mother, closer, pushing down, where I can't really feel. You have to be strong. And it's when she pulls away, I feel the blood running from sharp, sharp nails. So I'm just going to read a couple of more. Um, I had this wonderful conversation with Danielle before, uh, before the reading started. Um, so I'm going to read a poem uh, called Poet Wrestling with Rick and Morty, and mostly Rick, uh, but mostly Rick. I am well aware of the show Rick and Morty that Rick's character is, is troubling. You know, he's not a great guy. He's not a nice guy. Uh, and I have people point this out to me all the time. They're like, oh, how can you like Rick from Rick and Morty? And and I, I don't understand that question. This, this poem is a critique of his character. Um, so anyway, and I, I do adore the show though. So this is Poet Wrestling with Rick and Morty, but mostly Rick. It's all about the heart, they say, that cross, that shine to compromise. Either you are creator or you die on some pagan holiday. Most everything we get twisted. Most everything is either science or shockwave of endless favor. The asking, 
the ridiculous heart getting lit on blood that never dries on marked doors of unrequited sin. Who do you think you are? I've wed my own body vermilion, blushing in brickish electric plush these organs. Make my spleen a shrine to excess. Who doesn't have time for infinite timelines? Is not your greatest sphere unity, that horse I am eternally breaking? Is that a new dress? Try the heart you left to gray and shiver in crawl space, false heart floating through failing body, same heart spoiling other hearts so ferric and weed whack. How they beat beneath the changing of horses. Either love yourself or trust a woman who changes doorposts and signs to unidentified equine. Either are or return to cinder. You say the aim of being you is being you and creation alone is the favor. When all language will always escape and betray its creator. You don't know what you are saying of infinite pain. Please help me. Either horses change to natural disasters or frozen ground heaves the silence of its ruins. Now it's time to walk. Wipe your face off with pure glycerine and sage. Creation is a spell of double negation. So I'll close with this poem. Um, when, I, when I fell ill, People always think I'm being cute. I'm really not. I, I was terrifying. I started to see um, this bunny. And everyone thinks that's really cute until I tell them that it had fangs and it had blood red eyes. And it was always watching me, right? I would see it all over the place. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, that's, you know, probably your neurological, you know, it, you're getting things like confused. But this bunny was very real one time I saw him because anyway. So I'm convinced that um, this bunny was an agent of a force that I explore in the book called Ephes. And Ephes is modern Hebrew for zero, but in traditional, I mean, in, um, in Hasidic literature and in Jewish mysticism, it means to nullify, to conceal. So what I found is that even if I'm sick, and even if this is a simulation, Life is worth it. Struggle is worth it because I believe that evolution is putting these obstacles in our way. So we will find ways to cope. And then when you, when you overcome that hurdle, there's more. And the hurdles never stop because that's meant to evolve us. So I felt like this bunny was trying to remind me to push on, right? Don't give up. So this poem, Poet Wrestling with the Poetics of Unsolved Physics, um, even if you don't know anything about physics, um, you, you know, it, I think it still works. But if you do, you'll see that I've inserted different um, ideas that are unsolved in, 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 in contemporary physics. And I, I did a reading at um, MIT, and uh, there were some students, you know, who, whose majors were uh, physics, and they, they got the jokes, and it was just really funny. Anyway. Thank you so much for listening. This is Poet Wrestling with the Poetic of Unsolvable Physics. Maybe I am writing this to get you to stop pursuing me, my little vampire bunny. And maybe those questions aren't meant to be solved. Maybe they are playing you and me like a fork a little too sharply tuned is the true nature of dark energy. Being a little off is the right kind of beacon for eternity, owes everything to lust, the cruelest kind of swelling that cannot release release and will always cost any kind of future worth remembering. Maybe I am writing this for you, my sweet, sweet, but I'm lost in a bigger thicket of grit and greed, wanting more of itself just a little longer. Do you ever think that's why you're always hungry and those love bites aren't so tender and whatever force drives you to spring upon me doesn't yet exist? It's okay to say, well, nothing would change. You would still love me. I don't mind the attempts to fertilize immortality. 
But does perfect pitch lead anywhere and beyond closing a circle? Like tying intricate knot without purpose. But go on, in any way, bind my legs and arms in your infinite and immaculate vampire bunny charms and gravity of desire. Isn't an eternal light left alone in perfection, a life gone stale? I'm betting and only on defects and kinks as what moves anything forward. Now, it's not light or reaching apex, not the kind of animal you pretend to reconcile. I know the living dead are real every time you kill me to prove my protons are fundamentally stable. Talk is cheap as it is small. I'd rather take chance to get gnawed and chewed and chomped and become delicious and seduced as evolution is seriously screwed since questions seek out their own silencing. Is that why you bite me dead, my little bunny, to turn us into peculiar velocity? Your quantum features seek my gravity and maybe infinitely cottontail and fangs caught on doorways because dark energy says we shouldn't. What multiplies when yet still I arise from torn fur and nails digging. Maybe it were big bounce more than big bang. Maybe dry veins nibble and one more night were still bloody peas and quarks. And maybe it's not important to the theory of everything. But even after they come for you, I keep and keep seeing and everywhere my sweet little blood sucking. How you appear suddenly on trains, popping out of cat carriers and staring from screened windowsill. Is that not you purring at the diner when they serve you up medium rare on gilded plate? Scunned and still bloody, steam rising from the toothpick they speared into your twitching cold heart. And I tear onto my tears like the problem of capital T theory and my ears like capital E everything. Is it all over the moment one gets just close enough to what is ultimate and final? Is that when everything is proven fatal? Because such proximity does not lead to anything more than little vampire bunnies who are just as human as the last question I will eat from my own swollen and stained lips. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rosebud. That was an amazing reading. Um, you're getting love in the chat. So we can take a second to appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for reading that poem. My, my youngest kid, Silas Rose, read it last night and totally got that it was a critique of Rick's character and said, oh, right, this is like those moments in the show where Rick gets really maudlin and right sentimental about the fact that it's very hard to be a genius creator and in control of destiny and things. So was definitely on your wavelength there. Um, so um, I am so grateful to writers and books for this event and to Rosebud for being here um, and to Rosebud's gorgeous book um, for keeping my brain open and thinking and moving. Um, and there's loads we could talk about, but I think I would like to start with, you know, um, when I received the book and read it, uh, I was not surprised by the number of appearances of hospital rooms and hospital-like spaces, um, illness, things like that. But they are, you know, they aren't proclaiming themselves on the cover of this book or things like that. Um, and I started to think of them in the poems as these really interesting agents of unsettling our assumptions or our givens. So I went 
wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about how illness, um, surprising or chronic or um, difficult to diagnose or whatever it might be persistent, um, sort of um, makes it harder to agree upon the stable reality of those big foundations. Um, how maybe the medicalization of illness does that a bit too, or maybe does it more so. Um, and at the same time, maybe how it lets us like that vampire bunny, see a possibility beyond the erosion of those foundations. Right. Well, you know, one of the things that um, unfortunately happens, and I'm not, I don't disclose what I have because I just can't, I can't bring myself to do it. I admire those who have had, have the same autoimmune condition I do, and they do. I'm not there yet. And um, you'd be surprised, like I get a lot of people who I don't know, they just say to me, well, just tell me, I won't tell anyone. I'm like, I don't know you. <laughs> like, I really don't know you. So, you know, I didn't want the book to focus on illness because one of the beautiful things about poetry is that even so with my particular illness though, one thing that is common is that you lose some mobility. Um, and the beautiful thing about poetry is I can do whatever I want on the page. And I've learned to take up space um, for myself. And now that I'm doing that, um, you know, it, it's just really freeing. And I don't do it in every single poem. In the next book that I'm writing, I, I don't do it in every single poem, but the poems that I do, it's, it's really strange because I'll just, I don't know how to explain this because of, of my condition, but a lot of poems are just coming out in one go. And a lot of the, the ones in the book did very little editing because I don't know how to explain this. My throat is dry. I'm sorry. But um, I just, I, I hear it on the page. Like I'm, I, I hear this music and it's like three or four overlapping things, like a, like a music mashup. And I'm trying to translate it in a way that makes sense for other people. Cause to me, it sounds, it sounds fine. Like I understand exactly what's going on. And so one thing that poetry has allowed me to do is that when my speech becomes confused, um, sometimes, you know, I do make these mistakes because of, uh, it affects my brain. Um, you know, in poetry, um, that, that can be a beautiful thing. And I, I said this to my neurologist the other day, I'm starting to realize that there are moments when my speech might not seem confused if you're looking at it linearly, but it's doing something else in the art. And so, I, you know, it, it's really strange. And, you know, I, I do remember reaching out to a poet um, and trying to explain what was happening to me. And, he said to me, well, you're not that special. You just have an illness. And it, it's an odd thing too, because I think sometimes it can come across like I'm saying that, oh, I'm just anointed with all this talent. And I, that's not my point. My point is that what is often regarded as an illness and it is an illness. And, you know, I am, I am on different, um, you know, medications and therapies for it. Um, I, I wasn't trying to say, to say that, but I was just saying that I do believe, as I said before, that these hurdles can be placed in your way. And I do feel like I was being nullified, which is why I reached out to this poet, who I won't say who it is, uh, even though I have that, what he wrote me in writing. I'll just never forget that as long as I live. Um, you know, and I was thinking about the ways in which I felt I was being nullified. And, you know, I just, I was just trying to return to my faith. And I was thinking about how every Hebrew letter has a number right? But there's no letter for zero. And so they created this idea of Ephes. And then when I went into its roots, I realized that I, my father had told me a long time ago, Ephes is a very dangerous idea. And that's all he said about it. And um, so I took the idea of the three heads of the crown, which is, is more about creation and traditional um, Kabbalah. And I re not reversed it, but I switched it to where the three heads of the crown, in my view, are rooted in Ephes. They're rooted in um, Ephes, which is uh, signifies to nullify, to conceal. And then the two other crowns, which are Ion, and Ion has all these negative connotations in Hebrew, but it, it signifies in this case, nothingness. And then you have my personal favorite, Tohu, which uh, symbolizes chaos. And those for me are the three heads of the crown. Um, and yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but the, the book 
I'm trying to show that um, this is less about illness and more about just being given a opportunity to, you know, to not to overcome this hurdle, but to face it and then try to get it to unconceal itself and realize like I've evolved as a person and I've evolved as a poet as a result of it. Um, so Allison Myers has a lovely follow-up question here. And yes, that did answer my question and took us to some cool new territory. Um, so Allison's asking, do you struggle with what to disclose in poetry and risk getting the sort of dismissal you received from like, let's call that person the anonymous and maybe um, purposefully, um, purposefully numbskulled poet um, as if your poetry is merely confessional, which it isn't, right? And which the confessional itself is not, right? Um, so, so what happens there? Do you worry about that? No, I don't worry because I knew what was going on. And if I can be honest, there's poetry is a very small world, right? And it's very competitive. And this person, the numbskull, um, was very friendly to me until I, I won the Alice James Award for this collection. And he does this stuff where, oh, well, I shouldn't say, whatever. Um, but he does this stuff where he, he probably has done it to other poets when he hears something you've won, then he wants to see the manuscript. And, you know, I just, well, you've probably seen a lot of the poems online because a lot of them were published. And he was like, oh, so a lot have already been published. He's like, humble brag. And I'm like, what? You know, it, 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 it was more of a reflection that he is someone that does not want to share like the spotlight. And, um, you know, I've also gotten a lot of um, criticism that the book is too complicated. They said, you know, we understand like this is a reflection of your mind, but you could take one of your poems and talk about it for like five hours. And I'm like, why is that a bad thing? And I love technology. I'm like the first to um, embrace it. I love AI. I love simulation theory. And I also realized that it's changing our intention spans. And I've been making these TikToks um, and sharing them on social media to explain different concepts in my poetry using music that I love. Um, and I often think that, you know, there's just, there's just a lot of competition in poetry. So if someone like this, this guy sees you doing something new, I think that really, um, you know, that can just push other people away because they see you as competition. And I'm just very resistant to that. You know, I, I think poetry is a very, uh, you know, it, it, it evades definition. It, it always attracts to me some of the best of people. Um, there's no money in poetry. Uh, and I just don't think that it's very beneficial for us as um, a species to uh, bring in these sort of ideas, you know, um, that, you know, I don't know. It, 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 it just really turned me off. So when he did that, I knew what he was doing. He was trying to get me to doubt myself. <laughs> I just, I'm like, are you, you know, he wasn't listening. I mean, I've been very ill, you know, I mean, once, once you've faced, I think a great, um, tragedy in your personal life, um, and I've had many, um, you know, just comments like that, they're just very strange. I, I don't know. I don't know if that answers Allison's question, but to be, to be brief, like don't let anyone stop you from doing what you're doing, um, as long as it's not harming anyone, right? I mean, you don't wanna hurt anyone, um, but pursue, pursue your magic, you know? Right, and perhaps he misses, uh, misses the point a little bit too, right? Dismissing you for not being special, right? Um, part of the reason we do this is because one might not be special, but have the capacity to articulate something that hasn't gotten well articulated before, right? So if being sick doesn't make you special, um, I think about this as somebody with an autoimmune disorder too, um, right? Sometimes I think about how Poor that so much of the language we have to speak about it, how dissatisfying it is to talk about it. And so if I can maybe um, either through illness or around it, get some of that language on the page and change the way we talk about it or let it resonate, that seems actually, um, you know, an important way to not be very special. Um, and I think this brings me back to thinking about your zero here, um, that something would think it could 
could both nullify and conceal. Um, and that seems to me what a comment like that maybe tries to do to a person to nullify you, but it doesn't cancel you out of existence. It just sort of conceals what's really um, emphatically valuable about the work. And there are many places in the book where I think we're we're hearing from a voice um, the poet who wrestles um, that would conventionally be canceled out would be nullified and concealed and not allowed to speak these things either because they're um, sort of regarded as heathen, right? Changing the way that we look at, um, that we look at a creation, uh, a creation belief, or because they're coming from somebody who does not have the privilege of automatically having the platform and the microphone. So um, as you were working with this nullification and concealment, did you, did you see some sort of ways in which, um, nullifying is maybe um, undone by these structures of religion and science collapsing a little bit or um, was there something else to that notion going on for you right so actually and i finally admitted this on twitter only because um i i have a lot of different people reading this book it's kind of blown me away the response um there's one critic who i won't say who it is i've noticed he just if I can say shits, I don't know. <laughs> but you know, he shits on every every book that's published. And he actually loved mine, which was kind of odd. Um, but it's reached a lot of different people, and it reached it's reached a lot of mathematicians and, and scientists, and it reached a mathematician who figured out there's hidden math in the book. I won't I won't disclose it. I'm sorry. If if you find it, you find it. If you don't, you don't. Um, and I think part of that idea is, is based on this idea of concealment and nullification. Um, the book has a very strong point of view, right? I, I have people say to me, how did you come up with something so original? I honestly can't answer that question. It, it just, it, the, you know, it just, it just came to me um, again through my life as a person rather than my work as a poet. It, it just, you know, I needed it to like cope. And when I think about the different ways in which nullification works, I wasn't just talking about for my own personal life, I was also talking about a particular force in physics, and I, I won't get too much into it, but each, um, each head, head of the crown in the book has a counterpart. So tohu, which is chaos, to me that symbolizes matter. So everything made up with atoms, everything that you and I are. And then ion to me symbolizes dark matter. We don't really know what it is. We perceive it as nothingness, but we don't really know what dark matter is. Recently, news came out that there's less dark matter in the universe. Again, I won't get into it. Um, and you know, it, ion, as I said, spoke before, it has all these like deceitful connotations in traditional Judaism. Um, it, it's fascinating to me. But the one that I'm really focused on again is Ephes, and that to me symbolizes dark energy. Um, and dark energy is this force, we don't know a lot about it, um, that is slowly causing the acceleration of the universe. And so that one day, our great, 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 um, you know, uh, going into the future, um, if, if this continues, um, the, the future generations will look up into the sky and they won't be able to see the stars, they won't be able to see the planets. Um, you know, it's just gonna keep accelerating everything. and we're gonna to have to find a way, and this is far into the future, so don't worry, uh, it's far into the future, but we're gonna to have to find a way to, um, to cope with that. And we're gonna to have to find a way to get past our um, many obstacles. I mean, I, I don't even know how to list all those, just you know, the many obstacles in our way in order to um, travel. And so this is just a short aside. I know we're, we're short on time, but you know, something I was asked recently, you know, do you want to be buried or do you want to be cremated? So I can't be cremated because of the Holocaust. And I made a, a promise to my family. I wouldn't get a tattoo because my grandmother had a tattoo and I wouldn't be cremated. Um, so all I want is to, you know, somebody just, if they can purchase me some antimatter, which I realize is very expensive, you know, just purchase some really big magnets to keep it in place. And if you smash your matter with your antimatter self, hypothetically, you should be able to travel at the speed of light. So my promise, and I always joke about this, is that if I can raise enough money at, when it's my time to go, I would love to be um, 
you know, I would love to collide with my antimatter self, and then I'll tell you all what it feels like to travel at the speed of light. I mean, I say that in jest because I won't be able to talk. I won't have any more matter. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've always loved science and, and to return to it as a poet, I've just been, um, I just feel very blessed for that. So, I guess that's a form of nullification. <laughs> Lovely, lovely. Um, I, I feel like maybe, in fact, what does happen is already here in the book, that it's already um, come through. I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Um, we, we are running shorter on time. So I think um, uh, we'll, if nobody else has a question, I'll just kind of ask this one last one then. Um, this, um, you know, this theme comes up time and time again in the book, but I'm going to quote this last few lines from Poet Wrestling with an Ode to Her Brother. And these last few lines, right? You never had to become who you are. It was always there. Right. Um, and for me, this was very much um, a, <clears throat> a few lines that could read nihilist or incredibly optimistic, yeah. right? Um, could sort of read as what happens when we collapse antimatter into our matter selves. Um, it reminded me of that theorem we all learn when we're young, that matter can't be made or destroyed, only converted. Um, and um, in reading that theme come up at time and time again, um, you know, I would say, well, is this, you know, should I be feeling optimistic as a reader or should I be feeling kind of existential Essentially um, freaked out and it's a little bit nihilist. Um, and I kept coming back to a place where I was like, right, I don't think I should be feeling either one of those things. I think it's about really just being able to get my head around that, to believe in the science as one does with faith about something they can't necessarily touch or wholly comprehend. Um, so what did you um, what did you imagine for you or maybe for readers? right um holding this book should it cover that full range of like hope and fear do you think it's an optimistic book do you think it's a bit nihilist how would you define it oh I you know I have this quote I I just had a poem come out in a great new um journal uh that was founded by a, a, an amazing poet I forgive me for forgetting her name um but I, I wrote a poem after Solaris, uh, the 1972 version, not the George Clooney one. Um, and it, it's a fantastic Soviet film. And there's this quote from it that I include in the book, you mean more to me than any scientific truth. And so with that particular poem you quoted um, about my brother, he's, he's a man of principle, which means he always does the right thing. But there's also sort of a, a, a a, a, you know, some dead water with that, that he's not, he's very resistant to change. And so things that happened to me, well, they happened to me in our youth. I, I went through something um, as a child that was really terrible. Um, and uh, it affected me, it's affected me for the rest of my life. And so he's always tried to bring me back from it, but his understanding of it is not the same as like him trying to help me. Um, and so, you know, he's, he always has known who he is since he was a little kid. And that sounds wonderful, but it also sort of limits his ability to change and grow. Um, so I, I suppose, you know, that's kind of a comment that even though there, I think there are people that are like that, um, I don't care. You know, I, this book is, is, is really about loving people. Um, even when they, they disappoint you or they hurt you, I just, I believe so strongly in the capacity. I'm getting, I'm tearing up a little bit. Um, I believe so strongly in our capacity to, um, to evolve as a species. Um, I, I myself went through a lot last year and we were in a pandemic and I, I literally had friends come into this, to my home to save me when um, they put their own lives at risk in a number of ways. And the things that I have seen in my lifetime, the cruelties that one can inflict upon a child, the worst thing you can do to a child, I went through. But the capacity for love is, um, I, 
it's astonishing. So that's a beautiful place. Right. And I, I don't think humans invented love. I don't want anyone to think I'm saying that, but um, our capacity for curiosity and love is, is boundless. And so I know the United States itself is going through a tough time right now in a transition, but um, I am brilliantly hopeful for this, um, for this world. So. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you, Rez. But no, that's gorgeous. And I think I think we should cry. Um, I think, you know, the sad place we're at, but also the capacity is really very astounding. And that's very palpable in these poems. Um, I want to thank writers and books again, Rosebud. I want to thank you. What, a, what an absolute prize to get to speak to you at the end of a day about so many gorgeous things in poetry. I want to thank our audience members. Um, this has been really, really extraordinary. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Dan. And thank you so much for the wonderful questions. And thank you to everyone that attended. I know everyone's kind of zoomed out. And I just, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This was really wonderful. Um, thank you to you both. Uh, I want to thank our funders. Uh, buy their books. Their links, the link is in the chat. Uh, you can catch up with videos of previous readings, including this one at our website. And I want to thank everyone for coming and have a great night. Thank you.